Okay, we can start now. Hello everyone. I'd like to extend a warm welcome to all and especially to our speaker today, Dr. Elisa Tasbihi. But before introducing Dr. Tasbihi, I'd like to say a few words about our interdisciplinary research hub. You can also read about it on the MIAS education page. The research hub has been created to provide a space and support for research students from around the world whose research relates to the work of Ibn Arabi coming from different uh, disciplines and methodologies. As part, of, um, as part of the research hub, we have been running this series of presentations, talks by invited speakers. After the presentation today, two of our research students will pose their questions in a roundtable discussion. Following this, all attendees will be able to ask questions as well. You can do this by writing your question in the chat function, or if you wish to ask your question verbally, then please use the raise hand function. So it is now with great pleasure that I introduce our speaker for today. Dr. Elisa Tasbihi, who is a researcher and a specialized cataloging editor for Islamic manuscripts at McGill University in Montreal, Quebec, Canada. She received her PhD in religious studies from Concordia University and an MA in Islamic studies from McGill University. Her research specializations are Early Modern Islamicate Intellectual History and Theology, with a focus on textual analysis of Sufi literature and theological writings in Ottoman, Persian, Iran, and the broader Persianate world up to the 19th century. The title of Dr. Tasbihi's presentation today is Haida Amuli's Shia Commentary on the Fusus al Hikam. Um, and please um, know that this, this will be recorded. So, with my pleasure, I would now pass over to Elisa Tasbihi. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Yafia. Uh, good afternoon, good night, good evening uh, to everyone uh, from all over the world. Uh, I'm joining from Montreal. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for having me. I would like to thank the organizers at the Interdisciplinary Research Hub, Ibn Arabi Society for inviting me and providing me with this opportunity to present my research on Haider on Shia commentary on Ibn Arabi's Fusus al -Hakam. The current study is an analysis of the esoteric perceptions of Haider Omali on the subject of Balaya and Imama as reflected in his Nasun Nusus Fi al Fusus al Hikam, which is a Shia commentary on Ibn Arabi's Fusus al Hikam. The aim of my study is to answer some of the following questions. What was the purpose of drawing and diagrams? And why the diagrams appear in the form of circa? Who are the eligible people to grasp the divine knowledge? And what we learn from these diagrams? What kind of mystical knowledge can be extracted from these diagrams? My focus will be on these of six out of 28 circular diagrams in Amelie's text. The diagrams are among the most important parts of Nasr Nusus since they are meant to help readers decipher the difficult esoteric concepts the author is striving to explain. I will elaborate upon the importance of number 19, which is mentioned specifically in some of these Daba'er diagrams, and its esoteric significance, which is defined by Amuli as representing the spiritual friends of God, known as Aulia, including seven prophets and 12 Imams. According to Amuli, these friends were capable of receiving direct esoteric knowledge or ilmul ladunni. I will argue that Amuli is following closely and in some part literally Ibn Arabi's teachings regarding the divine knowledge and qualities of perfect man, insan al-kamil. 
who is qualified to obtain that knowledge. His usage of cosmographical diagrams also aligns with Ibn Arabi's mystical style of presenting his doctrine through the language of allegory and mystical images. Nevertheless, Amelie stands in different line on the concept of sainthood and brings in his Shia theology, arguing that only the heirs of the Prophet Muhammad are the qualified awliya, and through them, the line of mystical knowledge is being carried out. We will discuss more on this. Amuli, as he was popularly known, was a Shia Sufi theologian acclaimed for his integration of Imami Shi'ism, Sufism, and the thought of Ibn Arabi into a coherent system of philosophical mysticism. Amuli is also known for his emphasis on the unity between Shi'ism and Sufism. He states, quote, most Sufis imagine out of ignorance that the immaculate Imams were devoid of all mystical or Gnostic qualities while Shi'ats have been deluded into thinking that the character of the Imams was exclusively restricted to the conventional science of their day, end of quote. He was a synthesizer of Ibn Arabi's metaphysics into the Shia tradition, and his commentary on the Fusus reads through Shia doctrine with an emphasis on an imamology. Amali's commentary follows closely the reading of the Fusus. The Fusus al-Hikam is one of the most precise, short, writing of Ibn Arabi, written in 12 chapters. The title of each corresponding to one of the prophets, as discussed by Sadr din Unabi, the stepson of Ibn Arabi, it contains the epitome of the spiritual perception, love, of the prophet Muhammad concerning the knowledge of God. It also points to the source of spiritual perceptions of the prophets mentioned within the book. The Fusus explains how each of the prophets manifests certain divine names and attributes. Since Muhammad is the greatest, the epitome of Insan al-Kamil, the perfect man, and the last of the prophets, his station embraces all the perfections possessed by the other prophets. The Muhammadan reality is the greatest name, the name of the essence itself. This is why his spirit was the first created by God. In fact, Ibn Arabi mentions uh, the name of the prophet at the last of Fusus al Hikam and dedicates the last chapter, the last fast to the prophet as being Jame, the comprehensive, including all the divine names. Commenting on the Fusus, Amali employs a unique visionary language and through his series of cosmographical diagrams elaborates specifically on the spiritual state of the Prophet Muhammad, his spiritual journey, and his hairs, the 12 Imam, through the line of Fatima and Ali, who represent Muhammad and Awliya. All these cosmographical diagrams comprises of 28 mandala-like circular forms, and they are intended as graphic aids to the text they accompany to elaborate Ibn Arabi's discussion of the divine names attributed to each prophet. Why circular? The popularity of circular representation in Islamic cosmographical diagrams no doubt reflects the universal acceptance in Islamic culture of the Aristotelian belief that the sphere is the most perfect of all forms. As Amelie argues, God could only have created the best of all possible worlds, which naturally led to the conclusion that the universe was a sphere. Here, Amali alludes to Ibn Arabi's argument on Quranic materials, where he said, when you start drawing a circle, you don't stop until you reach its beginning point. God created the universe in his own form, which is the most perfect form. Thus, the sphere is the most complete shape to represent the divinity. In drawing diagrams, Amali also aims at explaining some of the condensed theological and mystical subject discussed in the Fusus by adding his own explications, emphasizing that this is knowledge for everyone and it should be kept separate from those who are not worthy of grasping the mystical knowledge. On his recommendation, he refers to Quranic, numerous Quranic verses and um, emphasize, emphasizes on hiding the mystical knowledge from those unqualified or unfamiliar with the mystical knowledge. 
And he explains that the main reason to demonstrate the divine knowledge by means of circular diagrams is to illustrate such knowledge, which I attained through prevailing cash, spiritual perception, log, which were revealed to me through intellectual and sensual examples. He continues, thus the most concrete way to, read, to teach such divine knowledge is through demonstrations of cosmographical diagrams and circles. And in fact, Amoli argues that uh, discussing and demonstrating this mystical knowledge through diagrams will help to decipher the hidden knowledge and make it easy for those who are qualified. If they have the knowledge and talent and if they are the qualified uh, saints or the qualified people mystically, it's easy for them to grasp the hidden meaning of this secret knowledge. Know that the existence is formed in the shape of circle, where the initial point is connected to the last point. It is the most complete of all forms. Everything comes from him and goes back to him. He is the center, emanating his evolution to all possible existences. And at the end, they all go back to him, no matter where they stand in the circle of the universe. In a way, we are from him and we go back to him. His compassion encompasses all beings within the circle. Uh, here I would like to start sharing uh, the PowerPoint slide. Uh, so it's easy to grasp the knowledge and you will see how uh, Amelie explains some of these tout and ideas discussed by Ibn Arabi in the Fusus and the commentary that he made on the Fusus. This is the first diagram. Due to the emphasis given to the prophet in the Fasus, Omri's first diagram is dedicated to the prophet and his spiritual journey, through which he received the mystical knowledge, which was later passed on to saints following him. This particular diagram is called Rab al the station of two bows, mentioned in the Quran, chapter 53, verse 9 and was at the distance of two bow lengths or nearer. Refers to the prophet's ascension journey. And it refers to the proximity of the encounter between the prophet and God at the night of ascension, known as Mi'raj. That means the space between the bows is very narrow. Some commentators interpret this as a narrow space between the angel Gabriel and the prophet. The encounter represents the closeness between the physical world and the spiritual world. In the first diagram, we see the experience witnessing God and the realm of the divinity through his mi'raj, which is known as a spiritual ascension. The event is associated with the night journey, known as Isra, which is also known as the horizontal journey, during which the prophet is believed to have been taken by Gabriel while mounting upon a winged animal named Borak from Mecca to Jerusalem, Masjid al-Aqsa, where he then experienced a celestial ascension to the furthest mosque known as Beit al-Ma'mur, after meeting and praying with prophets of the past. Muslim scholars are divided about whether the nocturnal journey took place in a dream or was a mystical, physical experience undertaken while the prophet was awake. The Orthodox Islamic view holds that the spiritual ascension took place in both body and spirit, meaning prophet really went in flesh and spirit to uh, see the realm of God, let's say. Some philosophers and metaphysicians argue that the prophet's journey was a mere intellectual experience, while some scholars and Sufis maintain Muhammad's nocturnal journey was a spiritual ascension. For example, Aristotelian philosophers such as Ibn Sina argue this journey was an intellectual journey and the journey that Prophet made was in his mind and the opening he received was an intellectual opening or it was an intellectual transformation through the proximity he gained with God. Sufis vary on this. For example, Ibn Arabi argues that the Prophet's ascension was a journey by spirit, not by flesh. 
and he reflects on the account of Miraj in, in the Fusus, Kitab al Isra, Al Al Maqam al Asra, and chapter 167 of the Futuhat. For Ibn Arabi, the Prophet's night journey was a spiritual one that must be followed by each of the saints or mystical knowers who would seek to particularly fully in the heritage of Muhammad. So for Ibn Arabi, it is possible to step in the foot uh, step and follow the foot step of the Prophet and gain similar experience. Amali clearly follows Ibn Arabi's discussion on experiencing the spiritual proximity and witness of the divine by saints and awliya. The encounter between al-wajib and al-mumkin. <clears throat> the section represents al-wajib, which refers to God, and this part is al-mumkin, which is the Prophet Muhammad. And there is a fine line between them. It's where both met, so Prophet Muhammad gained proximity and gained the spiritual state by being close spiritually to God. As illustrated in diagram and based on the explanatory appearing on the clockwise left semicircle, you will see some of the notes written by Amali and here and some here. God is the absolute necessary al-wajib in existence. And the notes on the clockwise right semi semicircle read that the Prophet Muhammad is the epitome of possibility, al-mumjah, in existence. The concept of the two arcs in close distance has been discussed as part of the notion of the Muhammadan reality, haqiqa muhammadiyya, which appears as the principle of all spirit life and reflects the cosmic dimension of the Prophet's spiritual journey by virtue of which it is, since the beginning of the human journey until its end, the spiritual master of the universe as discussed by Ibn Arabi. Haqiqa Muhammadiyya appears as the principle of all spiritual life. It also reflects, as I mentioned, the cosmic dimension of prophets, a spiritual journey. Amali elaborates on the meaning of cosmographical diagram by referring to prophetic hadith, which says, as though the time of meeting was a return to the initial time when God created heavens and earth, meaning man enters from the realm of form into the realm of spirit where there is no physical time, which closeness and unity with God takes place. So basically, he means, Amali means that prophet left the senses, went through this spiritual transformation. The time went back to the original time of creation of the spirit. And that's how and when the proximity and the encounter between God and the prophet took place. The circle is surrounded by four smaller circles. And as described by Amuli, they represent the great words and beings belong to each. This is the word of knowledge, al-aql, which is belong to the divine power, al-jabarut. Soul, this is jism, belongs to al -Zan. The soul from the realm of divine sovereignty, al-malakut. And body from the form of humankind, al-insan. And nature from the realm of divine ownership, mulk. So basically, human being who has the knowledge, has the body, has the soul, and lives in the nature. He is part of the nature. With the help of God, by gaining the spiritual knowledge, can experience this proximity. The next question is, who are the qualified saints other than the prophet? who are able to receive the complete knowledge and divine revelation. In his introduction to Nasr Nusus, while explaining the reason for writing the commentary on the Fusus, Amali elaborates on the importance of Insan al-Kamil, who is the most qualified to receive God's divine name and mystical knowledge manifested in the Prophet Muhammad. Quoting Ibn Arabi, Amali writes, quote, what is particularly important about Muhammad is that he has been a cosmic being before he was, he was raised as an individual prophet, 
at a certain moment of human history in the capacity of God's messenger, end of quote. He bases his argument on a famous hadith where prophet describing himself as a being of cosmic nature. I was a prophet, even while Adam in clay and water. Of course, the scholars explain this particular hadith as saying that the spirit of Prophet Muhammad was created, the light of Muhammad, Nura Muhammadi, Hariga Muhammadi created before Adam was created. Following Ibn Arabi's doctrine of sainthood and quoting the Quranic verse, chapter 10, uh, verse 62. The friends of God will certainly have nothing to fear, nor will they be grieved. Omali asserts that God chooses his friends as those who embody the best qualities of the human race. God's friends are first and foremost the prophets. His revelations to the prophets then make it possible for others to become his friends as well. Each prophet is a source of guidance and a model of human goodness and perfection. Those who achieve the, the status of friendship with God by following the prophet may then be given an inheritance, wasi, from the prophet. According to one of Ibn Arabi's doctrine about sainthood, Balaya, God's friends are those who inherit their knowledge, the stations and the states from the prophets, the last of whom was Muhammad. The Wali is the one who is selected by God to be for him. Omali places the friendship of God within a cosmographical diagrams. And he puts that context, he puts that concept into the context, pointing to a very decisive similarity and acknowledging divine inspiration even after the death of Prophet Muhammad. According to him, prophethood, Nububba and Rasala comes to an end, but Vilaya subsists to eternity. That is why God is called Wali as divine name. He adds, Vilaya is superior to Nububba, since it is the ending face of beings. In Ibn Arabi's conception of Vilaya, Vali is the widest concept, comprising both Nabi, prophet, and Rasul, apostle. An apostle is the narrowest of all. Every apostle is a prophet, and every prophet is a saint, but not vice versa. In this respect, the saint is radically different from the prophet and the apostle because the words Nabi and Rasul are not divine names. They are peculiar to human beings. Wali is a name of God, but God has neither called himself Nabi or Rasul. While he has named himself Wali and has made it one of his own names. So Wali is one of the divine names. In other words, since Wali is a name common to God and man, and as God exists everlastingly, sainthood will exist forever. Thus, according to Ibn Arabi, which was followed Closely by Amali, as long as there remain in the world even a man of the highest spiritual power who attains to the rank of sainthood, and in fact, such a man will certainly exist in every age, sainthood itself will remain intact. Saint is a manifestation of perfect mankind in Zan al Kamil, and in the following diagrams, you will see that Amali illustrates mankind's completeness in physical and spiritual aspects. This is the physical, Alam al-Suri. You will see in the Alam al-Suri, the zodiac signs, the nature, the seven planets. And uh, the next diagram that I'm going to show you, you will see the name of prophets and his awliya, his friends. For each of the natural elements that every human being, we all share, regardless of our spiritual status. We could be a normal human being without gaining that spiritual knowledge. For all the natural elements, especially the important ones that you will see this zodiac signs and uh, and so on, and uh, the, the name of the months, and the Arsh, Kursi, uh, the divine power, Amali assigns 19 letters, which is the Basman, starts clockwise from the left to right. As you know, all the Quranic chapters, except the chapter Toba, or pendant, starts with Basmala, Bismillah, Rahman and Rahim, which has divine attributes in it, Rahman and Rahim. Omali assigns each letter to all these natural elements, as well as the seven prophets and 12 awliyas. And by assigning these, he would argue that 
both when they coincide, they bring natural harmony and balance and mise-en to the board. Omali illustrates mankind's completeness in physical and spiritual aspects. By comparing man and incomprehensiveness to Basmala in the Quran, he argues that incomprehensiveness of Jamiya, mankind in Kitab al Afaq, Book of Horizon, is like Basmala in Quran. It gets power from the divine names and is as important as art in the body. As we see in the diagram, like the Quran, which is comprised of all the divine names and attributes, mankind in the world of form, in the Alam al Suri, and the spirit. Here, I will explain this table. Assumes the highest position by his close connection to God and receiving the divine effusion, faiz, and knowledge, ma'rifa. I included all this information in the diagram in this table to demonstrate how Aumali envisions mankind's important state in the world. Cities are natural elements, uh, the seven planets and zodiac sign. For each, there is an assigning letters from Allah. Each letter gets the spiritual power and uh, divine divinity from God. So basically, God and his divine power is behind the world and the world, the order of the world. And this world and the natural elements are connected to humanity. Thus, the spirituality and God's divine and grace goes through the world and runs the world in harmony and balance. The order and balance of the physical world depends on the orderly functioning of seven heavens, natural elements, and kingdoms of souls, and each of them is protected by a designated letter of Basmala. Following Ibn Arabi's discussion of Rajal al Sab'a, the seventh uh, awliya, and basing his discussion on the Quranic verse, chapter 4, verse 163. As you will see, Omali makes his argument. He mentions seven prophets as the most sublime and the greatest of all prophets to achieve the state of Valaya. Adam dwells in the first heaven, Jesus in the second, Joseph in the third, Idris in the fourth, Aaron in the fifth, Moses in the sixth, and Abraham in the seventh. He points out the strength of the relationships to the designated heavens in the diagram with respect to their levels. This is the word of the spirit. You will see the name of the prophet known as Ot, the pole, and the rest are Aulia. Their states and the levels of their communities for the states of these prophets in this world are the outward form of the properties of those heavens. As I said, for each, there is an equivalent properties in natural world. Uh, the information in this uh, diagram uh, that is uh, explained in the form of written and plus these um, semicircles and uh, the position of each of the prophets and uh, their olia, I extracted and put them in this table so it's easy to read. Again, each prophet, which is known as Paul, Ot, and here, which I follow the clockwise, that's why some of them appear on the top and some at the bottom, each um, there is a letter from Basmala assigned to each prophet, which again shows that the divinity goes through uh, God and his word directly to his awliya and his prophet. The diagram shows each of seven prophets in the center as God. Let's go back to this. And we see 12 saints for the three prophets, Adam, Moses, Muhammad. So we will have another diagrams here. Again, this is all Amul Surah, the word of form. And equivalent to this, we have the word of Ma'na, spirit. Here, we will have those natural uh, planets at the center, and then the natural zodiac, surrounding them. And uh, these are the Arabic months, Muharram, Safar, Rabiul Abbal. It's easy to read. Again, four small circles on the side 
explains that they all gain power through knowledge and through the body. So basically, humanity and the world needs this body, the physics, to um, have this experience through the knowledge and through the nature uh, with the help of nafs and just. And the second uh, diagram is the Alam al Ma'na. We see Prophet Muhammad uh, is at the center, which clearly demonstrates the position of Muhammad among mystics, such as Ibn Arabi, who is the manifestation of Insan al Kamar, uh, who is at the center. And as I mentioned, even in the Hadith, Prophet Muhammad would say, I was create my spirit, the Haqiqah was created before Adam came to existence. So we see Adam, Moses, and Muhammad, who received the divine knowledge through their Utb, Nabi and Prophet. The four semicircle mentions the rank of Uliya. Utb means Nabi and the Prophet. Bos means Rasul, the perfect human being, who has the comprehensiveness and the comprehensive spiritual quality of the Mali and Nabi. And they are Fard, this is Qutb, so basically Nabi's first diagram, it's a prophet, it's the Qutb. And then these are the stations of the Bali, the Awliya, Vatat. But the Rasul is the perfect human being, is the, the Qus. Fard is the unique one, loved by God, chosen and entrusted by God. And Bali, or Vatat, who is the Caliph and supported uh, by God. The seven prophets, again, I uh, distracted all, all the information and made it in, to read in this table. You will see the name of seven prophets and their oliyas. Seven prophets receive divine knowledge from God and then passes, passes it to their oliya. And it's through their operations that the world continues to exist. The oliya will protect the seven territories that we saw in the world of uh, as surat and the spirit of seven heavens will protect this oliyas. So there is a connection between olia and uh, the territories and the na nature, basically. The order and balance of the spiritual world depends on the spiritual power and action of seven prophets and their seven saints. A designated letter of Asmala protects each of them. The Prophet Muhammad and his perfect followers manifest the all comprehensive and the greatest name which embraces all the universal names and realities of the world, not only one or some of them. Here I would like to mention, as we see in this table, you will see the name of seven prophets, Adam, Abraham, Moses, David, Jesus, Prophet Muhammad. With Prophet Muhammad, you will see the 12 Imam, which represents and reflects Amuli's Shia doctrine, uh, who believes that the chain of sainthood goes through Muhammad, uh, from Muhammad to Fatima and Ali to 12 Awliya and uh, till Mahdi, and from Mahdi it continues. So it's not dead, it's not closed. Here I would like to mention kind of a mystery in this tale. In the text, uh, Amali uh, does not mention the name of the Olia of David. He does not provide us with any information on the prophet David's Olia and explains briefly the names of David's Olia are missing, which was, I found it very interesting. And their names could possibly be looked for in the Torah and Zabur. That's what Amali claims. It is not clear to us why there is no mentioning of Dawood's or David's only Islamic sources. David or Dawood, as he is referred to in Arabic and Islamic source, was a prophet and messenger of God. He was, according to Hebrew Bible, the second king of the United Kingdom of Israel and Judah. According to Islamic sources, he received the divine revelation, Wahi. And his name is mentioned several times in the Quran and uh, clearly, in, the, in chapter, for example, in chapter 38, God says, Oh David, indeed we have made you a, a kingdom, a king and caliph earth. So judge between people with justice and do not follow desire, or it will lead you astray from the way of Allah. 
in Fasl 17, chapter 17 of Fusus al Hikam, Ibn Arabi mentions uh, some qualities of uh, David. In fact, chapter 17 is dedicated to David, Dawood, and he mentions Dawood has a hikmah, and he and Solomon were able to speak the language of birds, and he emphasizes on the hikmah that he, David received from God uh, to perform justice as an official caliph and representative of God on the earth. He was more than a messenger. He was a divinely guided leader who established God's rule on earth. David was involved in social and political affairs and was engaged in wars as a king, which led to killing several people. This could possibly explain why Amuli refrained from mentioning his awliya. Another reason that he mentioned, of course, it was mentioned in Fusus and Nasunusus is a commentary on Fusus. So obviously David, as one of the uh, prophets who receive revelations, uh, his name is mentioned as one of the seven prophets. Uh, he has a rank, he has a spiritual rank as a prophet who is mentioned in the Quran. We made his kingdom firm and gave him wisdom and conclusive spirit, uh, speech. And the fact that his kingdom was firm, he was granted wisdom, hikmah, and conclusive speech, as well as the divine revelation he received from God. Amali ranked him among the seven prophets. However, he does not provide why the names of David's only are missing and why no religious or historical sources gave any reference to their names and spiritual status. The name of Olia for other prophets were mentioned clearly in Torah, and most likely Amali has been read Jew Jewish sacred books and sources to verify Adam, Abraham, and Moses' spiritual heirs. However, as I mentioned, he refrains from mentioning David's saint, so I needed to mention this. Amalie's diagram represents a complex network of correspondences between the two major spheres of creation, the world of manifest, corporeal entities, and the world of hidden, the spiritual beings. The two complementary phases of creation are referred to by Amalie as the Kitab al afa Book of Horizon, and Kitab al Anfus, Book of Soul, respectively. Also involved in this science of correspondences is the Book of Revelation, the Quran, which seems to act as an empirical, empirical device in the effort to discover or uncover the series of correlations that underlie and connect the two creation. So basically, we have the universe, the world of nature, humanity, and the world of spirit to selected friends of God, Olia and Prophet. And as you saw, for each, there is a letter from the Quran signed to give them a spiritual power. By collating these two holy reads, the inspired exegetes can see God manifest himself in the vastment of letters, words, and chapters of Quranic text on the one hand, and in the form of manifestations of his names and actions on the cosmic horizons on the other. It is then that the mizan order can be achieved in the world. Seeing God simultaneously as both invisible and dispersed in the things and phenomena of the empirical universe is the privilege of divine messengers, prophets, friends of God, Olia, and God's chosen ones. Only they can comprehend allusions, al-isharat, assembled in God's two books, the cosmos and the Quran. One of the key terms of Ibn Arabi's theory of Wilaya is the seal, khatam meaning the ultimate and final unit of this. According to him, the term Khatam appears in two phrases, the seal of the prophethood, Khatam al-Anbiya, and the seal of sainthood, Khatam al-Awliya. Each of these phrases come in the form of al-Mutlaq, ultimate, and al-Mughayyat, limited. According to Ibn Arabi, the seal of the ultimate prophets designates the prophet Muhammad himself, and the seal of the limited prophet is Jesus. He attributes a sublime state to Jesus, stating that he will be resurrected to wives, months with Anbiya prophets, and for the second time with Awliya. Thus, Jesus also represents the seal of ultimate sainthood. 
The first phrase on the prophethood is often used in accordance with the common belief in Islam that historically Prophet Muhammad represents the last ring of a long chain of prophets. At the same time, in several passages of his works, Ibn Arabi identifies himself with the seal of the saints or with the seal of Muhammadan sainthood or limited sainthood. Even the followers and the disciples of Ibn Arabi calls him among the, or the seal of the sainthood. Amul argues that the ultimate seal of Velaya is Ali, and the limited seal Muqayyad, of Velaya is Mahdi, who for Amuli is identical with 12 Imam. On this issue, Amuli clearly differs from Ibn Arabi, who identified the Khatamul Velaya al Mutlaq with Jesus, and who was himself regarded by some of his disciples as the limited seal. And this is where Amuli's Shia doctrine comes forth. Highlighting numerous spiritual qualifications for 12 Imam, he begins his argument by narrating one of the three dreams he received in Khurasan, Mashhad, and Baghdad on the subject of the lawyer. I chose one of them. Omuli narrates in a dream that appeared to me in the year 755 or 1354 in Baghdad, I noticed I was standing on a bridge in front of Madrasa Mughisiyya and looking up to the sky, when I saw a plate of a square shape, as you see in this diagram, which was divided into 14 small circles, inside each was written the name of 12 Imam. Now, this is the square shape. This, this is Muhammad. This is Fatima. And this is, again, okay, I will read you. This is Prophet Muhammad. This is uh, Fatima. And then from Fatima and then Ali, we have. Uh, Prophet, uh, the second um, Imam. This is Ali, the cousin of Prophet Muhammad, and that's his daughter. From their marriage comes the second Imam, and then uh, this is Hussein. Okay, like so this is Ali, the second Imam, the third Imam, and then here goes Sajjad, the fourth Imam, and then as I said, the third. This is the fifth Imam, the sixth Imam. Ja'far, this is the eighth Imam, and this is Musa, the seventh Imam. And then the rest, Muhammad al uh, and this would be Mahdi. So it goes here and ends at Mahdi. So Mahdi is closer to Muhammad. Uh, please pay attention to this. It starts with Muhammad, Fatima, and Ali, and then goes clockwise and ends at Mahdi. Since, according to Shia doctrine over Shia, Mahdi is still alive and passes the spiritual knowledge that he received from God to his followers and his disciples, you will see that closeness and proximity to Muhammad. That's why the circle ends here, which is, uh, which is close and kind of has proximity to Prophet Muhammad. So in his dream, he explains, when I saw a plate of a square shape, which was divided into small circles, inside each was written the name of 12 Imams, the Prophet Fatima. The names were written with red gold on a big blue background. Four circles enclosed the square. Inside each was written the name of Muhammad, corresponding name of the Prophet, and three Imams. The sky was lightened up and Prophet kept sending their salutes. People kept sending their salutes and greetings to the Prophet and his family. Then I heard in the dream a call saying, they are the ones that are purpose of creation and the manifestation after the prophet. They are the abdals. Abdal is a term coined by Ibn Arabi. Support, aqtab, poles, awtab, support, and afraad, unique ones. And the ultimate sainthood, velaya mutlaq, and the limited sainthood, velaya muqayyada, ended with Mahdi. They are God's caliphs in the earth, and the last one of them is Mahdi to receive the divine names and knowledge. Indeed, with the appearance of him, the world will end and then comes to resurrection. Amuli continues his argument on the notion of Mahdi being the limited sainthood by quoting from the Quran. And uh, by uh, referring to Quranic verses, as you see here, he makes a justification why Mahdi could be the last living saint, the uh, Khatam al awliya even though he passes the knowledge to other awliyas. Omani argues that the verses are intended to talk about Mahdi. 
That's his interpretation. He further explains that Mahdi is the last of saints through the line of Prophet Muhammad, who was the seal of all prophets. Sainthood will end with him. The day he appears for bringing justice in the world. So as I said, is even though he was the last Imam, he's still alive. He receives the grace and blessing. Since he is alive, then the line of saint is alive through the Shia doctrine. He elaborates on some of the qualifications attributed to Mahdi, which makes him more qualified to be the limited saint than Ibn Arabi himself, and which sets him apart from other saints and makes him the last of Muhammad and Uliya. He even dedicates some drums for Mahdi. You will see here, you will see the ancestors of uh, Mahdi, that um, how uh, from Kaab, I won't read for you. This is the explanation and his commentary from the Quranic verses that I mentioned, uh, and I showed you in the previous uh, slide. It starts, I mean, four circles uh, surround this big circle. Adam, this is uh, Ali, this is Isa, Jesus, Moses, and Abraham. And Mahdi, as the living saint, locates at the center, who receives blessing from these prophets and carries on the grace of God. Mahdi is more qualified for being the last Imam, he argues, since he is coming directly from prophet's family, thus like the other 11 Imams, he is infallible, ma'asum, and immune to sin. Uh, diagram 13 is this designed to demonstrate Mahdi's spiritual state as the last valley from the hair of the Prophet Muhammad. So I would like to conclude my presentation. Amuli made extensive use of Ibn Arabi's cosmographical concepts to develop an esoteric allegorical dimension of Shia theology. I may conclude that the use of diagrams is meant to refer readers to a specific topic topics discussed throughout Amelie's work in more detail, which also allows author to refer back to his diagrams whenever he discusses subjects, such as Nubuva, Imama, Vilaya, God's divine names and attributes. The Prophet's ascension, God's essence and existence, his manifestation, Tajalli, microcosm and microcosm. In fact, the diagrams are employed as clear and efficient methods of presentations of cosmographical ideas. Some diagrams are correlated to pairs of diagrams, such as diagrams eight and nine, 10 and 11, that we saw, which means those specimens exhibit a certain measure of correlative thought between man and the universe. The word of form, surat, and ma'na, the meaning. The word of exoteric, of laher, and esoteric word, al -bata. In this case, the diagrams illustrate the orders of existence or component parts of the universe, which are correlated with each other, as well as those that are presented as partial or total representations of the structure of perceived reality, material and spiritual. A close analysis of the diagram indicates that there is a connection between them similar to the chain of divine names and attributes assigned to each compassing the entire divinity in the last fas, which is the name of the Prophet Muhammad. And as we saw, uh, the 19 letters coming from Basmala connects the word, the universe, the word of nature with the awliya. In Amuli's diagrams, we see the connectivity between the graphs, as though each diagram represents a certain aspect of divinity presented the 12, 27 prophets discussed by Ibn Arabi. However, the Prophet Muhammad and his perfect followers manifest the old comprehensiveness and the greatest name, which embraces all the universal names and divine attributes. A special emphasis on Mahdi are given to Mahdi and 12 Imams and Fatima, and dedicating four diagrams indicates Amuli's Shia doctrine through which he attempts to read and understand the Sunni theological texts of Al Fusus. Here I would like to mention um, about um, Fatima's name. We can read, of course, there are different interpretations of reading Fatima's name in the diagram. Uh, one aspect of this could be when it comes to receiving divine message, 
spirituality goes beyond the gender. You could be women or men, doesn't matter. There is no gender in receiving divine message from God. Or we can say uh, that wasn't that Amali had in his mind since he was an adherent follower of Shia, 12 Shia doctrine. And since he believed in, in 12 uh, Oli, come through the line of prophet. And since prophet didn't have a son and the line came through the marriage of Fatima and Ali, thus he gave a special, uh, special status for Fatima. In any way, we could read this particular diagram and the name of Fatima. I would like to end my uh, presentation here. And if there is any question, I would like to answer. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Paspihi, for that uh, illuminating uh, presentation. And thank you for introducing us to the work, the method of uh, Haider Amuli and his relationship to the Akbari tradition, and also for walking us through uh, the diagrams. And it was really fruitful, really interesting, really illuminating. Thank you very much. Um, now we'll be moving on uh, to the round table discussion with uh, two of our research scholars, um, Celia Salazar and Florian Halili. Uh, before I introduce that, before I uh, invite them to the, to the round table, I'd like to introduce them and also give an idea of their research interests. Um, uh, Celia Salazar uh, is a psychologist graduated from the National Autonomous University of Mexico, where through her deep interest in mysticism and religion, uh, she participated in several projects related to Middle Eastern studies at the university's Philological Research Institute. The title of Celia's graduate thesis is uh, The Hermeneutics of the Symbolic Imagination, an Encounter Between the Thought of Gilbert Durand, Henry Corbin, and Carl Jung. The aim of her study is to find the link between the religious symbol and the imagination through a transdisciplinary dialogue between Gilbert Durand, uh, Henry Corbin, and Carl Jung. Um, Florian Halidi is uh, currently pursuing his MA in philosophy. Uh, his interests lie in the different ways of knowing the human condition as explored in the spiritual traditions, in philosophy, and in science. Uh, the presence in Ibn Arabi's thought of these different perspectives for exploring the key questions of human experience is of central importance for Florian's further study of Ibn Arabi's writings. So with that, I would like to invite uh, both Celia and Florian to the round table for discussion with uh, Dr. Taspihi. And maybe I could invite Celia to go first with her question and then we Continue. Yes, thank you very much, Paradwash, and thank you very much, uh, Dr. Elisa Tazvihi, for this fascinating article. I read it lots of times. It's just very revealing, and I'm grateful for it. And um, my question is related to Amoli's notion of time. Um, he says, well, I'm, in, in your article, um, it's mentioned uh, like this. It is it is as though the time of meeting was returned to the initial time when God created heavens and earth. And my question is, is, is in these moments when unity with God or when the divine takes place, uh, when there is this transformation of time, um, if it's related to the balance between the corporeal and spiritual worlds, um, this is if, if there's a relationship between the change in the notion, in the notion of time and the balance of the world. Um, I'm asking this because in Carl Jung, there is this uh, concept that is called uh, conjunctio oppositorum, that is the, the moment when the unconscious and the conscious uh, united, get united. And um, he says that in this moment, there is a change of perception in time in consciousness. There's a new consciousness that is born that is called the eternal child, but that's another thing. But he says that um, it's, it is like, it is as if uh, the, lineal, the lineal time changes into a circular time, a circular perception of time. And this also gives balance to the self and gives balance to the soul. 
So I was wondering if there's something related to this in Amelie's uh, theory or Amelie's uh, notion of, of time. Thank you so much for the question. Interesting question. Uh, perhaps I could learn from you. I'm not familiar with Jung's idea on the time. I haven't read it. Uh, but from the commentary that he made on Fasul, uh, on Nasun Nusus, uh, on Fusus Ibn Arabis, I see that he follows closely uh, Ibn Arabi's notion of time. In fact, it's a complicated subject, and there are discussions on this issue. Uh, I could mention to some of the discussions, for example, Jenner Dagli and Eric Winkel have written and presented, and you can find uh, their articles in the website of um, uh, the society, Ibn Arabi Society. Uh, in fact, um, Jenner Dagli, I pre he presented this article when I was an MA student, and out of curiosity, I wasn't planning to read Ibn Arabi at that time, just I liked Ibn Arabi, and I read some passages. I went to New York at the time I saw that um, many Ibn Arabi scholars came, and Jenner Dawley offered, presented a fascinating, very fascinating presentation, time and no time, according to Ibn Arabi, and he brought in lots of physics notions. It was very scientific, and he made the conclusion, uh, very, if I want to make it very simple, that we need time uh, without a time there is no meaning in space in fact if there are objects in the space and we want to say that something happens before this or after this we need time so basically the notion of time according to ibn arabi is relative i will explain more that's how he concluded eric Rinkel brought many passages from ibn arabi very conclusive and also there is a good book time and cosmology by muhammad haj yusuf also he focuses on the concept of time now according to ibn arabi time is a distance a notch in a circle since we talk about diagram and circle i chose this particular passage to be able to answer in case somebody asks because time i knew time would be problematic it's a ratio of distances, a relation of one thing to another. Ibn Arabi describes timing and time period in terms related to prayers. For example, he says, when we pray in the morning, then we pray in the afternoon, there is a time. We want to differentiate, so it is relative. We, we have this time to say have a night prayer. We have a morning prayer. This is something man-made. When it, got, when it comes to God's time or the time relates to God's power, he calls it dahr, which is comprehensive. When it comes to humanity, we have the notion of asr, zaman. In this particular case, we have zaman, we have yom, we have ayam, different parts of the day and night. These are the humanly time that's relative. That's how Ibn Arabi discussed. We need this a certain element to function. In order to events to take place after God emanated and asked for creation, commanded create, creation to come to existence, this humanly time came to existence. The moment God created humanity, we have dahr, and according to Ibn Ali, dahr is part of divine emanation. It's part of his tajalli. It is not part of his essence. So when it comes to prayers to be performed throughout the 24 hours, he generalizes. He writes, section on the timing, awat or wakt, makes sense when we want to relate them to certain events. I do not mean by the discussion here on timings of the prayers, timings only, but rather I mean time as time, 
whether it's connected to worship or to something else. So time gets meaning in the human world in relation to objects or events or certain incidents. Therefore, let me make you aware of its meaning and its significance as we begin with the time set down by law for prayers. We say time is an expression for the assignment of something which does not accept an existence in itself to be assigned. It is the notch as we assign time. We assign to the glutar shape a first and a middle and an end. But itself, it doesn't accept the first, the end, nor the middle. So it's us who assign and give the meaning to the time. We say it's morning, it's at night, it's noon. We give them this meaning and this function because we need, as General Dougley was explaining through the language of physics, which was very complicated for me, still it is complicated. He says, we need this because if we live in the space without time, how could we say, or how could we understand God's command of creation? For example, the concept of death, something died. It died yesterday. That means it moved on. When that body perished, there is that timing is necessary. So time comes to action when the universe takes the form of surah. So time is necessary to give it meaning as part of the creation by God. All of these periods, these are again Ibn Arabi's notion, and I'm trying to explain for myself even. All of these periods, though, have no real being. They are only relations, so it's relative. One celestial body in comparison or relation to another. He says that all of that has no being in itself. So time has not, it doesn't have any independent meaning by itself. It's a relation and as, as, ascriptions. What is existent is rather the orbit itself and the orbiting body, not the time itself or the period. For Ibn Arabi, the idea that something was created in the past and then continues in the present is impossible. He doesn't believe in such a thing because it would then be independent of God. But he believes that God is the creator. We can't say that morning is independent. Then something else or some other God should be there to create these objects or this particular time. Time is given the meaning for the functioning of the universe. For him, time or death is the divine emanation, tajalli, and one of the attributes, a divine attributes. It's not of God's essence. Time has no independent identity by itself. It has meaning in connection to other events and objects. Just to conclude your question, Ibn Arabi, um, Haydar Amali follows the concept of Ibn Arabi on this. And when he says, Prophet Muhammad experienced that proximity of Mi'raj and managed to witness the divinity in God as though the time changed. Meaning as though, because this Mi'raj was a spiritual, even for Haydar Amali. He doesn't say, because he follows Ibn Arabi, he doesn't say that prophet went in body. So if there is a transformation in a spirit, as though the time stopped, when you feel and experience the divine, there is no human time. As though the time of creation, the time goes back to that time, you don't feel the passing of the time in the physical meaning as humanity explains. For example, I started my talk let's say one hour ago, it's past, it is related. But when you experience the divinity, there is because you are in proximity with God, with the divine. The concept of human time has no relevance in that particular. This is what Ibn Arabi says and he follows. Sorry if it's complicated, but that I really did my best to understand and to convey. Thank you very much, Dr. Elisa. It's, it's just amazing your answer and makes me wonder much more about this. And thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome.
Thank you, Dr. Tasbih, for uh, such a wonderful presentation. And I really enjoy your article very much. Um, Thank you. And uh, it was really illuminating, uh, especially just the intertwining of the spirituality with the philosophy, as well as Ibn Arabi's thought with Amulis, as well as the Shia doctrine. So there's a, there's a lot happening at the same time on top of the cosmology and everything else and the number systems. So my, my first question to you really, uh, I was trying to understand from the article uh, to organize my thought process a little bit. What is uh, the difference for Amuli in between acquired knowledge, inherited knowledge and the spiritual knowledge? Uh, it seems like this is part of his thought process for, art, for the article and I just wanted to know a little bit more about it. Mm -hmm. Uh, my understanding from reading the commentary is that acquired knowledge is limited and it's indirect. You go to school, you read based on your capacity, your knowledge, based on your talent, you learn something. The acquired knowledge comes in different steps and it's limited. Everyone grasps knowledge based on their limitation, resources, and the capacity. Whereas the spiritual knowledge would be direct and unlimited. You grasp it directly from God. That's the subject of uh, each fas or chapter in Khusus al Hikam, the divine knowledge. And in between, we have inherited knowledge, which was the subject of the article and uh, the commentary that uh, Haider Amali discusses on the concept of Balaya, we have seven prophets and his awliya. They pass on, they are the vasi, they receive the direct knowledge, the direct divine and spiritual knowledge through the grace of God directly, and they are passing it to their uh, awliya, to qualified people. So they play the role of medium. They receive directly and they pass it to qualified people. So that would be the inherited knowledge comes through the awliya to other people, qualified people. Now, Sufis, not just Ibn Arabi, Sufis in general, for example, Rumi himself, would say that following Sharia or praying or uh, following certain rules doesn't necessarily qualify you to receive those uh, divine knowledge. You could be praying, but not purifying your heart. It is God who gives directly. Again, I want to go back to your question. The spiritual knowledge has nothing to do with the qualification, the humanly qualification, or following certain rules. You can receive it. As I said, by purifying your heart, being an honest and connecting, having an inner connection with God and removing all the obstacles. This comes in a contrast with the acquired knowledge. In acquired knowledge, as I uh, gave the example, you go to a school, you have to follow certain rules. If you follow rules, you don't get the degree. Now, and the subject also is different. In acquired knowledge, you gain certain knowledge that helps you in a limited way on the path. Whereas the direct and spiritual knowledge, it opens up your heart and your brain, and it opens the door for you. And you can help others too, if I want to put it really in a very simple way. So the inherited one comes through the medium, and the acquired is really limited based on your capacity capacity, but based on your interest, if you want to gain the knowledge, in the knowledge of, for example, science of physics, chemistry, science of learning the world, or learning about the world. Whereas the spirituality is a different world. And as you saw uh, in, the, in the article and uh, through these diagrams, Haider Amuli explains, this is, this is not the knowledge for everyone. That's why it is hidden. It is given to the qualified. Thank you. I hope it's... Thank you for that explanation. Um, we have about 10 more minutes. Um, if 
Florian or Celia have further comments or points for discussion, questions? I, I can ask one more question if, if there's no other questions, uh, definitely. Uh, because I found this so, so interesting and uh, specifically your diagram of uh, the profits and uh, the LVS of each profit. And, uh, you know, something from the Quran came, came, came uh, to, to my attention uh, where it says, there never was a nation but a warner has passed among them. And uh, I was wondering how, in Amuli's writing, uh, does this tie with his diagram of the prophets and the uh, alvias and the uh, potentially divine knowledge that you just explained earlier? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, I think we all could relate with this. Every society, because we need leaders, we need um, guidance. And either we put it in the form of a spirituality or non-spirituality. Going back uh, to the idea of Ibn Arabi of the lawyer and sainthood and how uh, Haider Amuli interprets that and make a comment on that, they believe that, yes, the knowledge, the spiritual knowledge, the wisdom, or as it's known as hikmah, goes through the chain of prophet and uh, awliya. And as I mentioned, uh, Mali is an attribute of God, is one of the divine names. Whereas Nabi is not the name of God. Nabi is more human. So prophets are messengers. They receive messages. Even though Prophet Muhammad was the last messenger, Khatamun Nabi. But yet we see that he passes the spiritual knowledge to his awliya. And this awliya could be the leader of the society. So basically, there is no society without any leader. Now, I don't want to say religious leader. I would like just to use the form of leader and guidance. Uh, so these uh, guides and leaders receive their knowledge if we put it in the perspective of spirituality, they receive from the source, either through Quran, they receive directly, or through inherited sources, such as previous awliya. So there is a possibility, even though the door of the Bubba or prophethood is closed, the awliya or the spiritual guides, or as uh, Ibn Arabi used the word abdal and aqtab and otad, all these, there are some of these spiritual friends of God because God's called them his friends. Thus, there is no society, no time that we have a society without any leader who doesn't um, grasp the spiritual divinity and a spiritual power. So basically, humanity is always or in a way, God never leaves them alone. There's always sources of guidance and uh, leadership that they receive the, uh, the divineness through the inherited sources, through the Basaya. I don't know if that answered the concern and the question. Oh, yeah, it was great. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tasbihi, and thank you, Celia and Florian, uh, for that wonderful discussion. Um, now it's time for the Q&A session. And as uh, Yafia has already mentioned, uh, the chat feature is for asking questions um, through text. And if you want to ask the question verbally, uh, please raise your hand uh, and use that raise hand function. Uh, with that, I'll hand over the Q&A session to, to Rin. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bharatwaj. And thank you, Dr. Tasbihi, Celia, and Florian for this uh, wonderful round table. So we have roughly around uh, 15 minutes to our attendees to ask uh, some of the questions. Um, so let's have a look. I think someone has raised their hand, but I'm trying to work out what that is. Just bear with me a moment. So just to, uh, to say again that you can post your questions in the chat 
or if you want to speak, you can raise your hand. Okay. Uh, Mary Ann and uh, Nasima. Pardon yes. Me. Nasima. Okay. Yes. Correct. So let okay. me. Okay. Yes. Go ahead, Nasima, please. Um, thank you so much. Um, I don't know if it's really a question. I'm just processing the impact of um, your presentation, Eliza. Um, it just made me think about um, the three levels of uh, a state of being, uh, nafsa lamara, lawama, and matmaina. And I wondered in the context of that, how can the non-prophetic in Aulia, the insano karma concept that you talked about, how the ordinary, the rest of the crowd, let's say, how do we... Um, taste that hull and this different level of as as we are um, uh, able to only taste rather than be a permanent station unlike the prophets and the Aulias. So it made me think about my work, I guess, of my own research. So um, about purification of the soul for all of us who are doing our own tazkiyah and nafs and I'm looking at it more from the Muslim psychotherapist who believed in this, you know, this reality of hakika. Um, yeah, so sorry, I'm really sort of thinking aloud with you. I'm not sure if that was a question there, but a bit more thoughts. <laughs> uh, well, thank you for the thought. Um, I don't have much to add this if you bring in the concept of nafs, because we all have uh, this challenge with our nafs, labama, amara, and mutmainna. This uh, text, because it's Fusus uh, al-Hikam, of course, they are talking, I mean, both Ibn Arabi and Haider Omri talks about certain uh, messengers of God and friends of God. Uh, but they don't uh, close the door for the humanity. They talk about the order of life and how God's grace and uh, divinity and kindness, his grace, passes through certain friends and uh, that helps with the order of the universe. Now, when it comes to individual uh, human being, I think that would be your question. There are different discussions that in the Sufi text, we see how uh, each human being who has nafs could uh, gain from this grace? Uh, I don't know if that was your question. If that was, then uh, some Sufis has different risalas. They rely on tawakkul, trust in God, and not losing hope, following sunnah of the Prophet if they are Muslims. Of course, in this context, we are talking about Muslims, Shia or Sunni. Uh, so following the Sunnah of Prophet, following the messages from Quran, but mainly as an individual, working on their nafs, mainly nafsul ammara, and uh, trusting God, and following the footstep of awliya, and trying to learn from them, and gain from their blessings. Now, there are different texts on this, how people can purify their heart, whether Sharia could help closely. One follows uh, the Sharia of, uh, of the Prophet, the teachings of Islam, and uh, there are different debates on this. But my main talk today was how a uh, universe uh, has, uh, gains uh, or takes its order through the grace of God, how God emanates uh, divinity through his friends, passes the grace to other people, and how protects the order of the world. So yes, we are part of the world, of the nature, and we are human beings, we have that spirit, we follow, some of us follow some of these oleas, and I'm sure gain uh, the spirit and blessings. 
not sure if that uh, was an answer or some reflections to your <laughs> question. So maybe I can learn more from you. <laughs> Thank you, Nasima, for the question. It's a difficult, it's a difficult topic, especially when it comes to Ibn Arabi. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the next question is from Marianne. Uh, please feel free to ask your question, Marianne. Unmute yourself, please. Thank you. Um, I am so <laughs> moved by your talk. It's wonderful. Um, I guess I have a couple of questions, if that's okay. One is... What did Ibn Arabi or, or Amuli perhaps, perhaps in this context, how did he, did he have any opinion of Al-Khidr? I haven't seen the name of Khidr, but Khidr would be one of the Abdals, one of the Awliya. We have stories of Khidr. I think I have seen it in uh, part of Al-Futuhat, if I'm making, not making a mistake. I can narrate briefly Khazar is still alive according to Sufi literature Rumi mentions it Attar mentions it like a school of Khurasan mentions Khazar's names the green prophet basically he is alive he's one of the Oliyas and his encounter with Moses has been the subject of rich Sufi literature that Khazar was given a permission or a mission basically and Moses follows him and there is a dialogue and exchange between them. Moses is one of the prophets that's also mentioned. Uh, he has a special um, position in uh, Fosus al Hikam. He, you saw his name in uh, the diagrams. Hedar Amali follows him. So one of the important Jewish prophets. Uh, Moses follows Khizr and questions some of his acts. For example, uh, Khizr makes some holes in a ship. This is one of the acts. But in the way that they would follow each other, and basically Moses follows Khazar, Khazar says, you are not ready. I believe that was at the early stage of Moses, because Moses also went through a spiritual transformation. It's possible it was before receiving the 40 commands, when he received it from God and came from the mountain, to guide the people. It's possible, I don't know, but it was during that process, he insisted to follow Khazar and Khazar said, you are not ready yet. I would allow you upon his instances, his insistence. He said, I would allow you to follow me you follow, if you don't question my act, just stay silent. He didn't stay silent and questioned Khazar on every element. And at the end, Khazar said, no, I leave you, you be. I leave you alone. I uh, engage in three acts upon the command, the divine command that I received from God. For example, the ship that I drilled and that sank because certain Ashrar was, they were living and they were going to kill certain people. And it was the moment I had to do that. Or a certain wall that I destroyed, you questioned me. There were under that, and there were orphan kids who were living in the neighborhood. So that shows that Khizr was one of the awliya, and he would receive the direct divine uh, spirit, divine knowledge, spiritual knowledge, and he would pass us on to other awliyas or other people who would want to receive that. Uh, I haven't seen the name, but maybe I didn't uh, come across in Fusus al Hikam. On the subject of Moses, Haydar Amuli mentioned some of these stories and uh, gave it a state of Vali to Khazar in uh, the commentary of um, Nas al Nusus. Yes, his name is mentioned. Um, thank you again, Isa, for answering this question. And we have more questions. I hope that we still have time to manage some of them. Uh, so the next one is from Shaheen. And he says, how does Amuli position his dismissal of Ibn al-Arabi's claim to the title of Muhammadan Walaya while essentially acknowledging his spiritual guidance and authority? Shall I repeat that one or it's okay? 
uh, I try to give explanation based on my understanding. Either, um, okay, uh, both Amali and uh, Ibn Arabi believe that Prophet was the Khatam al Nabiyyin. There's no question about that. Prophet Muhammad was last, the last. So let me uh, find the exact text because he believed in two types of the lawyer and two types of Nubuva. I want to read it carefully. Okay, I'm going to read that because the concept of seal and khatam is among the main concepts in uh, Ibn Arabi's doctrine. It's like the concept of time. Seal of saints and seal of prophets. Khatam al and Khatam al And for each, he has limited and um, ultimate. Prophet Muhammad was the seal of ultimate prophets, according to Ibn Arabi. He was the seal of ultimate prophets, Nububba Mutlaq. Jesus was the seal of limited, Muqayyad, Nububba, limited prophet. However, he gives a special, special rank to Jesus because according to Ibn Arabi, he will be resurrected. Like Mahdi, he's still alive. That's why he has two different rank. He has the seal of limited prophets, yet he has the ultimate, the seal of ultimate sainthood because he's still alive and receives the grace and the divine knowledge from God, and he will pass us on to the spiritual friends who are connected to Jesus. But when it comes to sainthood, Haider uh, Amali differs from um, Ibn Arabi. Ibn Arabi would say that I am the seal of the uh, limited sainthood, whereas uh, Haider Omoli believes that Mahdi is the seal of limited Velaya uh, and brings in Ali as the ultimate valley, Mahdi as the limited valley. That's how they value. With, uh, with Ibn Arabi, we have two different uh, sainthood, the ultimate and limited, Jesus and he himself, Ibn Arabi himself. But with Haider Amuli, we have Ali and Mahdi. Mahdi is equal to what uh, Ibn Arabi had with Jesus because they both are still alive. They receive the divine knowledge, direct knowledge, and they will pass on to their awliya, uh, to other friends of God. This is what I understood. And that's the argument that both Ibn Arabi, and, and that's how you see the Shia doctrine the Shia interpretation of Haider Omoli and the Fusus. Right. Uh, Basically, let me just add one more line. Even though Prophet Muhammad was Khatam al nabiyyin and he would receive Wahi, the divine revelation, it's important to note that Nubuwa ended, but Velaya is not ended. So the divine grace, the divine knowledge, and spiritual knowledge comes forth through the line of friends of God, not through the Nububa, because Nabi is the messenger of God. They would receive the message, other than some of them were Vali and the Nabi, such as Prophet Muhammad. That's how uh, the discussion was evolved with the same. Interesting questions. <laughs> there are quite a lot of many interesting ones, but I'm afraid we're going to have to take one last one uh, from uh, Safarin Khan. And I'm going to take the question number one. Uh, it says, isn't it non-duality, Wahda, a major consideration for Ibn Arabi and Haider Amuli, plus ittihad, unity and brotherhood on that basis? So why not? talk in terms of Bani Adam, which even Shia Hadith Qudsi prefer as a pivotal, inter as a pivotal integral point here? I, maybe we could, 
I have nothing against that. I need to go back to some of the explanations of Haider Amelie uh, on the Fusus. These were some of the examples that he mentioned in some of the diagrams. There are 28 diagrams. I just chose eight of them and you, you saw some names of some of the holias. It doesn't end there. Yes, there is a unity, but God created the universe. Uh, we can discuss that why, for example, among the natural elements, Haider Amelie chose sun. Then we can argue because of the light coming out of sun, because of the special functions of these natural elements, or the important positions of some of these prophets and some of the olia that certain importance were given to them. But yes, definitely there is a unity. I agree with that. It's just that I think these were just some examples of how this unity and wahka, yes, God is one. And uh, we have Kisra, multiple city, as opposed to one and unity. So the grace comes, and this is one of the arguments of Ibn Arabi. Wahda as opposed to Kisra. Kisra would be the universe and humanity and how they receive their grace. So these diagrams were just an examples, but maybe yeah, definitely you are right. We could maybe simplify and put it like that. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'm afraid we'll have to uh, finish with uh, today's session and I uh, wish like you talked about the time if we could ourselves go into some sort of a transformation stage and stop the time and we talk about this a bit more so thank you again Dr. Tasbihi for joining us this evening for the IRH team and the lovely Baharatwaj, Florian and Celia for joining us this evening thank, thank you, you so to much. Our, our attendees Thanks for organizing this. Thank you so much for all of you and wonderful questions. Thank you. <laughs> and have a nice time. Again, let's end with time. Time yes. in Arabic. Indeed. Yes. Thank Indeed. you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for hosting me and giving me the opportunity for exchanging the ideas and uh, discussions. <laughs> oh, we will <both> it. <laughs> Thank you again. Have a lovely day. Have a lovely evening. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you again soon. Bye-bye.